Hello everybody, this is Margie, and for the next hopefully 30 minutes, it might go a little bit longer than that, but I'm going to try to keep it as brief as I possibly can. We're going to talk about um, men's health issues, prostate, um, BPH, and cancer. An overview of what we'll be discussing in this lecture is the male anatomy, to include the penis, the scrotum, testes, epididymis, and the prostate gland. We're going to discuss cystitis in men, prostatitis, benign prostatic hypertrophy, and a little bit about prostate cancer. So let's go ahead and review the male reproductive tract. Paying attention to, and I'm going to use my little um, um, arrow here, Let's look at the um, the penis is right here, of course, and there's the meatus, and then there's the very, very long urethra, which goes into the bladder. The prostate sits right here, okay? And as you can see, the urethra cuts right through the prostate gland. That's why when we have hypertrophy here, it compresses this urethra and there's obstructive voiding symptoms. Other things to note, okay, here's the, um, the anus and the rectum, and this is why we do the prostate exam the way we do it. We put our gloved finger in through here, the rectum, and then we palpate this part, the anterior part and the lateral edges of the prostate gland. Very, very difficult to get up and around the posterior part of the prostate gland. So this is a very, what we call, gross um, evaluation of the gland itself because we can only tell so much. Now let's pay attention down here to the scrotal contents. Okay, of course, there are two scrotums and two testes. The testes is round and firm here. And then we have the, let's see, this is the epididymis. Hold up. Well, I don't really. Anyway, this right here, I don't know if it's showing very well on your screen, but this is the epididymis. And this lies um, superiorly on the testes. And then we have here the vas deferens, or the spermatic cord, which is right here on the superior pole of the epididymis and goes on up into the inguinal groove. So these are the areas that we're going to be discussing today. When we examine the penis, this is how we want to examine the penis. You um, take your forefinger and thumb and you gently compress um, the head of the penis here and you inspect it. Now, if there's foreskin, if it's an uncircumcised male, you want to retract um, the foreskin because you want to make sure that this um, meatus here is free of lesions um, and any other um, problems that could be there. We also want to check the urethral meatus to ensure that, there's, um, that it's located where it's supposed to be in the middle and that there are no discharges, lesions, little tumors, anything abnormal that you might see in this area. And this is, of course, the same method that you would use when you do an STD, um, take an STD swab. The contents of the scrotum should be palpated. The testes are best examined by gently palpating with the thumb and the first finger for consistency, masses, or unusual tenderness. A normal testes is firm and mobile. A hard area within the testes must be considered a neoplasm until proven otherwise. An immediate referral is warranted. In boys, um, older adolescents, and young men, we need to teach them self-testicular examination. The most common age for testicular cancer is between the ages of 15 and 35. 
So we need to let men know, just like we talk to women about self-breast examinations, that they should be picking up, they should be um, doing self-testicular examinations in anything that they palpate that they feel is abnormal, they should come on in and get an examination. This is how you palpate for the epididymis. Okay, once again, it is behind and superior on the testes. So you should be feeling right around this area, if you will. As compared to here, this is how you palpate the vas deferens or the spermatic cord. And of course, with either one, you should be no noticing that there shouldn't be any lumps, lesions, uh, tenderness, etc. If you do have um, an epididymitis, uh, chances are you are not going to be able to palpate the epididymis any more than barely touch it because it's a very, very sensitive and painful, painful thing. A rectal examination is an essential portion of the urologic examination in men and should not be deferred. You should do a 360 degree sweep of the interior of the rectum because what you're doing is you're looking for any masses. Um, and you should do this sweep before you go ahead and attempt to palpate the prostate gland. When you do palpate the prostate gland, it's approximately the size of, they say, either a half a dollar, or um, I like to think of it more as a, um, a walnut, because that's what it feels like to me, is a walnut. And actually, if you go ahead right now and palpate the tip of your nose, that's what the prostate gland feels like. It's very um, firm and should be non-tender. And when you do um, document your findings on a prostate uh, prostate examination. That's exactly, you should say it's firm, it's non-tender, it's not foggy, meaning is it mushy, and you should feel no lumps or nodules on the prostate gland. Once again, it's a walnut-shaped gland, gland that wraps around you, the, the urethra, and it has two very important functions. It produces ejaculatory fluid, and it acts as a barrier to retrograde urinary tract infections in men. So there's two things that men have going for them as far as getting a urinary tract infection or more commonly known in men as cystitis, and that is the length of their urethra, uh, the bacteria have quite a long ways to go to get on up there into the prostate or into the bladder. And also, um, it you've got your prostate gland there that um, supports the urethra. And um, also, that's a drawback as well when you're talking about BPH. <clears throat> There's three main prostate problems. Prostatitis, which can be due to inflammation or infection. Benign prostatic hyperplasia, or BPH, which is enlargement, and cancer. Let's talk about, where are we here, cystitis in men. Um, incidence is 10 times lower than in women. So it's very uncommon for a man to, pre man to present with cystitis or UTI symptoms. That's why actually, depending on the age, when men do come in and complain of dysuria, urgency, frequency, um, discharge, um, triage will not go ahead and order, if they know what they're doing, uh, urinalysis in men. Because once they get in with the provider, the story oftentimes changes as far as whether they're having unprotected sex or and uh, worried about an STD or things of this nature. Therefore, um, if they have just urinated, you will not get a really good STD swab from the meatus of the penis. And you should always go ahead and do an STD if you're going to, if this is in your differential, which oftentimes it's not, 
but if it is a new differential, go ahead and get your swab done for, for chlamydia and gonorrhea prior to sending the man down for a urinalysis. Let's see, if they do get cystitis, it's a route, uh, the route of infection is generally ascending from the uh, tip of the urethra at the meatus of the penis up through the prostate um, into the bladder and then up into the kidneys. But once again, it's just very uncommon as well for men to present with a pyelonephritis, whereas it's very common in women. The pathogenic organisms are very similar to those um, of women, 80% are from E. coli. However, however, do keep a high um, level of suspicion uh, in appropriate age group or from your uh, history that it also could be due to chlamydia and gonorrhea. And I'm not just talking about high suspicion in 17-year-olds now. You've got to remember our society is slowly changing or rapidly changing, depending on how you uh, want to look at it. And we do have a lot of elderly couples out there that have suffered a loss in their life of their significant other and or there's a high divorce rate in this country. So we do have a lot of the elderly out there um, meeting and greeting and having sexual relations um, with partners or individuals of the opposite sex. So do not rule out that a 70 something year old male or female can be presenting with an STD. And times have changed as well, and their uh, biggest fear when they were young was getting pregnant versus um, STDs, so they may not be using um, protective barrier. Uh, once again, cystitis in men, symptoms are urgency, frequency, dysuria, Sometimes they can complain of nocturia, and also they could present complaining of suprapubic pain or low back pain in and around where the kidneys are. Um, so these are all symptoms of, you'll often see LUTS, or lower urinary tract symptoms, in men. In older men, and I hate to see greater than 50 years old, ah, cystitis begins concomitant with the onset of BPH and increases as men get older. And cystitis in men of any age may warrant a referral to urologist for further evaluation, and that's really a gray area. Um, if I have a man come in, I might think about it and wonder what's up with this. I may go ahead and treat, but if they present to me a second time, I think I would um, perhaps refer them to urology due to that it's not a frequent Occurrence. Predisposing factors of cystitis or LUTS in men can be a chronic prostatitis. It can be hyperplasia with, with obstruction. That's commonly known as BPH. Uh, you might want to ask them: Have they had recent a recent procedure lately? Have they been in the doctor's office or the urologist's office and had a um, a cystoscopy perhaps, or have they had recently an indwelling urinary catheter? A lack of circumcision can be a predisposing factor to a cystitis, if you will, um, due to whatever. Maybe they were out camping for a few days. The hygiene wasn't exactly what it is typically. You don't know. And homosexuality or men having sex with other men, that can also be a pre predisposing factor. History. History, of course, is very important, and you want to know if there are any um, past medical uh, incidences of GU disorders or surgeries, past urinary tract infections. You want to know what medications they're on. And a point about history is, and especially with medications, when you get to the medication part of the history, oftentimes patients will tell you, oh, there's no changes. But really, research supports that that's not true. And three months ago, medications are old news. And more um, often than not, me um, medications have changed within three months of the past visit. 
You also want to get a good sexual history. Do we have um, a new partner? Um, and do they have a history of sexually transmitted diseases in the past? This really does tell you quite a bit. Your review of systems should be focused. Um, is there a dysuria, urgency, frequency, nocturia, incontinence, blood or pus in the urine? And do they have urethral discharge? Uh, do they see um, red blood cells in the urine when they void? Is there an obstructive history? And you need to be specific with men as far as do they feel they're fully emptying their bladder? Are they dribbling? Is their stream a good, have good force? Is there hesitancy? Difficulty starting their urinary um, stream. Do they have low back pain, uh, perineal pain, ejaculatory pain? Uh, is there an associated fever or general malaise? And of course, a great question uh, and to consider uh, any type of cancer is, is there an unintentional weight loss? And is there family history of prostate issues, BPH? Or prostate cancer. So how do we manage a cystitis? Well in men you're always going to get a urinalysis of course uh, to rule it in or rule it out and we always culture um, uh, urine from a male. Um, as things don't always show up on just a plain old routine urinalysis. The usual meds, like you would treat E. coli in women, um, of Bactrim, um, you would use in men. If you're thinking that it's a non-sexually related urinary tract infection or cystitis. If you think it's possibly sexually related, you can go ahead and prescribe doxycycline. That will eradicate a cystitis or urinary tract infection in men and also at the same time it'll go ahead and eradicate chlamydia if you think there's a possibility. You treat, um, you want to follow up one week post treatment for a repeat urine culture in men. This is something that's not routinely done with women but in men that do have a cystitis this is something that I do highly recommend. And if you think um, a man will need an IVP uh, and or a cystoscopy, go ahead and refer to urology. If I see a lot of hematuria or red blood cells in the urine on my urinalysis in a man, I might go ahead and refer to urology anyway so that they can get a cystoscope and make sure that we're not dealing with a bladder cancer, especially in men that smoke. Okay, getting on to acute prostatitis. This, of course, is inflammation of the prostate gland. 50% of men will experience prostatitis in their lifetime. The incidence will increase with age. The etiology is typically due to ascending infection. It can be a reflux of infected urine or an extension of an infection from blood, lymph, or the rectum. It's typically the organism is uh, a gram-negative bacilli or E. coli. It also could be due to Pseudomonas, and you'll also see Klebsiella. The symptoms you want to ask about to support acute prostatitis are fever, irritative voiding symptoms, perineal or suprapubic pain. When you do your physical exam, is the prostate swollen? Does it feel warm, boggy? It's a feel, and it's going to take experience. Is the prostate tender on a digital rectal? rectal exam and is it uncomfortable for the patient. You Once you do enough prostate exams and you know what normal feels like, you, you can get a real good feel for a tender, warm, and infected prostate. And especially too if it's an uncomfortable exam for the man that will clue you into um, a possible um, acute prostatitis. If you suspect it, you should be getting a CBC because you want to look for a leukocytosis and potential left shift. You're going to be looking for pyuria in a urinalysis, bacteria in hematuria. If you feel in its acute prostatitis, you treat, say with Bactrim, for a full 30 days. 
And I have, um, oftentimes men will come in and they will tell you that they get prostatitis and they've been worked up for urology and they're having their symptoms and it's back. And if you get your, if you do your DRE and you get your lab work and it looks like they're having it again, go ahead and put them on the Bactrim, uh, Cipro or Doxycycline for 30 days. Go ahead and look it up, the dosage and how it's, how it's um, prescribed um, for your man and also bring them back or it depends on what setting you're in. If you're in urgent care, you're going to book a follow-up appointment with your primary care provider um, 30 days later. And I go ahead and I do this for them so they don't blow off the appointment. I think that we've talked about the risk factors, but once again, recent indwelling catheter, rectal intercourse, any anatomic issue that patients may have with their urinary tract, you get this uh, information with your history question. Have they had a recent bladder infection? And if so, and now they're back with another one, I might go ahead and refer to urology. And do they have an enlarged prostate that will set them up for a cystitis or acute prostatitis? Then there's such thing as chronic prostatitis. And there can be, it can be due to bacterial and it can be due to non-bacterial issues. And their symptoms are episodic and fluctuating. And they have irritative voiding systems that come and go. And they have a dull um, perineal discomfort. Um, things that can help to enhance the comfort and to prevent exacerbation are pain meds, sits baths, stool softeners may help because anything that's going through the rectum, it may aggravate that irritative prostate gland that they have. Alpha adrenergic blockers may help because it relaxes a smooth muscle, causes vasodilation, and helps with that um, obstructive prostate gland as it relaxes. It relaxes away from the urethra and it may improve urinary flow. Think antispasmodics or ditropan. Once again, that will calm a bladder spasm and allow for a better urinary stream. And sex is good here it, with the chronic prostatitis because frequent ejaculations will promote prostate contraction and that helps also with the relaxation post-coil, if you will, of the prostate gland. Let's see, we went over this and I don't think we have anything more to say about it. Let's get on and talk about benign prostatic hyperplasia, or BPH. Um, the credits for this lecture per, uh, essentially are from the um, American Urological Association. I uh, usually use their general guidelines, and these guidelines with this lecture on prostate cancer in regards to PSA testing, etc., are from the latest guidelines from the American Neurologic Association, and they have changed since I began practicing a few, um, a few, oh gosh, many years ago. But it is defined histologically as a disease um, process characterized by stromal and epithelial cell hyperplasia, which is, it means, enlargement of the prostate gland. It's a constellation of unpleasant symptoms because obstruction um, is both urethral compression of the urethra by the prostate gland itself by virtue of where it's located and it's a dynamic um, uh, process because increased muscle tone of the prostate gland and the bladder neck uh, also causes the bladder to work harder to expel the urine. BPH is the most common benign lesion in men, so don't confuse this with prostate cancer, all right, because not all men that have benign prostatic hyperplasia or a very large prostate gland have cancer. Men can have prostate cancer with a normal size prostate gland. It's just that it's a cancerous growth or a hard nodule that's on the prostate gland itself. 
50% of males greater than 50 years old are affected by BPH. And here's a very good example of a, um, a, a BPH in a male. This is the urine. This is the normal prostate right here, and what it looked right here, and what it looks like. And this is why you can see when you do your digital rectal examination, you put your finger right through here, the anus, and there is a fairly normal size prostate gland. Look at this. This is the rectum here. If you go in here, you can get some appreciation that it's enlarged here, but you cannot get all the way around, once again, the posterior aspect of that prostate gland. So it feels enlarged to you or boggy. You need to go ahead and refer to urology because they have the latest and greatest uh, tools of, of um diagnosis that can really get a good feel for how large that prostate actually is. Symptoms can be irritative and or obstructive. Irritative voiding system are the frequency of urination. They can complain just like a female of having to go often um, and running to the bathroom <clears throat> and urgency. I have to go and I have to go right now. And then there's obstructive, which is, I have to go, I feel like my bladder is full, but I have difficulty starting my stream of urine because there's this whole thing about the bladder neck um, being hyper-toned, uh, as well as the prostate gland being um, perhaps, um, you know, um, obstructing the urethra. Uh, their stream may be slow, and then when they're done voiding, they might all of a sudden have this post-void dribbling that they're also not used to having. So when you do your history and physical examination, um, the new AUA guidelines recommend that, first of all, you do get a urinalysis and you do get a PSA level. This this is what, um, during your history. You, you want to get these two things. But in, included in your history is a validated symptom index to determine the appropriate treatment options for uh, BPH. Um, and that is, I explain this in I, the next slide. Um, the physical exam, of course, you want to examine your genitalia. And please do a full genitalia exam, including the meatus, the scrotum, the testes, the epididymis, the spermatic cord, and while you're there, you might as well test for hernias, um, and that's covered in um, another lecture that I have included in this weekly session. So I'm not going to go over that here. You are, um, you know what you're looking for, lumps, estimate prostate, prostate size, um, etc. Okay, the American Urologic Association Symptoms Index is very important for you to get familiar with, and they're online. It's superior to an unstructured interview in quantifying symptom frequency and severity of BPH in men. And this really is a standard of care, and it, it should be done. It must be done in your um, uh, interview with the patient. So I recommend, once again, that you have these forms printed off and in a folder some way so you can just whip it out, give it to the patient, or ask these uh, questions yourself. And there's seven questions, and they are, they cover about um, the voiding, frequency, stopping, starting, urgency, weak stream, straining, and nocturia. So if you can remember that all upstairs and include all seven, good for you, but you really should include this in your history. And, you know, it just makes, it's a good kudo for you as a uh, clinician and a diagnostician because you want to be, you know, reputable within your society, if you will. And when you refer down the road eventually of your male patients to a urologist, they will be impressed that you know what you're doing. The classifications will be mild, moderate, and severe. And treatment is determined um, by how much the patient is bothered by the symptoms. 
treatment for BPH. Now, once you do this symptom index, the score, if it's less than 7, is going to show mild symptoms. If the score is greater than 8, it's going to show moderate to severe symptoms. But go ahead and take a look at the rest of this. Are they bothered by their symptoms or not? Okay, if they are not, whether they, their score comes in mild, moderate to severe, then what we do is watch for waiting. All right, and then your follow-up with your patient is one year, unless the symptoms worsen, and then you want them to come back. The education is also the same. Decrease fluid intake at night, and cut down or out caffeine and alcohol, if possible. This is your treatment algorithm, and 